Well, let's pick up tonight in Psalm 119, 89, and uh, we're talking about confession, and we're applying this in various ways. But tonight, I want to deal with this one concept from Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And that really is the heart and the basis of our faith, and that really is the heart and the basis of confession. In other words, my perspective is that his word is settled. Amen. And uh, I remember years ago, actually, we were negotiating all of the points of agreement uh, when we borrowed the money to build this building. And I remember sitting at a table at one of our attorney's offices. Uh, there must have been eight or ten people there. There were maybe three, maybe four attorneys. And one way or the other, we were paying all of them. I mean, even if they're working for the other side, we're paying them. And so we'd come to some point or some paragraph, and uh, these are all trained men. They all have earned doctorates. And they could read the exact same paragraph and come to different conclusions. And I learned something right there. You know, in the, in the attorney profession, they say reasonable people can disagree on the same document. In other words, there's, there's different ways of looking at something. And so the last couple of Sundays, the last couple of Wednesday nights, we've been talking about not having an opinion when the word is specific. There are things the word is not specific about. The Bible won't tell you whether to buy a Ford or a Chevrolet, but the Bible is specific about some things. For example, like adultery. Well, in the same way that the church world is chipping away at the integrity of the word with regard to moral things. God's people chip away at the integrity of the word in other ways. Healing. You know, you start giving stuff up, and before you know it, you gave it all up. You know, it's almost like those, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. In other words, if, if you chip away, chip away, chip away, well, then at some point, the whole thing is worthless. And that's the way I feel about prosperity. That's the way I feel about healing. That's the way I feel about uh, living free and not dependent on anything, which would include, you know, in other words, for us, that would include drugs or alcohol. In other words, Paul talks about living a life independent, to not be dependent. So my aspiration has always been that if it was the will of God, I wanted it. Why don't we say that out loud? Father, if it's your will, Father, it's your will. I, want it. I want it. See? And, but people will try and put you on the defensive. They'll try and put you on the defensive about prosperity. They'll, they'll try and make you feel bad. I remember once Sue's dad bought a used Cadillac, and there was a member of that, her family by marriage that was a Christian. And when they came over, you know, Sue and I were in town, so family came over to Sue's parents' house, and the first thing out of her mouth was, well, why does somebody need a car like that, that fancy? And she's supposed to be a Christian, and, and I'm trying to witness to Sue's dad over the years. I was really irritated. I mean, he's, here's a lost man, a German immigrant, started with nothing, and he worked, and he built his business, and he was able to buy a used Cadillac, you know, go figure, that she would be offended at that. And then she makes this remark. I was, I didn't say a word, but I was irritated because I thought, you know, to denigrate any point of the will of God is to denigrate all of it, in my opinion. And then too, early on, I was influenced by Fred Price that what we teach has to be reasonable and we have to look reasonable. So Tonight, you know, I'm wearing a suit and a casual sh shirt. Well, if I was doing the new thing, you know, I'd be wearing uh, skinny jeans and a bodybuilder T-shirt or something. <laughs> but that is not appropriate attire for a 57-year-old. Do you understand what I'm saying? We were, we, were, we were with some pastors a while back, and uh, they're our age, maybe a year older, and... The wife was wearing something that was kind of between Paris Hilton and Streetwalker. 
And I leaned over to my wife. I said, what is she wearing? And Sue leaned over and says, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, but, but the point is, the, to reach people, it has to be reasonable. If it's unreasonable, you're not going to reach anybody. Am I helping anybody here? So I, I just don't have the right to go through here and pick and choose. Okay, once that's settled in my heart, well, then I come to the next thing, and that is forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Well, this, man, this just gives me liberty. This does not hem me in. This gives me liberty. Now, a companion verse, for example, might be John 10, 10. Jesus said, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so I was a young man. I'd never been to Bible school. I had no theological training. But I used to hate to go to church Sunday nights where my mom chose to go to church when I was a kid in high school because Sunday nights they had testimony service. And I never understood the, the term testimony service because it was really a glorify the devil service. And so this was a full gospel church, and, you know, it was typically old women, no offense, and uh, occasionally young women, and then occasionally old men. But they would stand up, and they would tell about all their troubles, and then they would blame God for all their troubles, and then they would sit down. I mean, there was no confession that, you know, I'm going through this, but praise God, I'm coming through it. There was no confession that... You know, Satan has attacked me here, but I believe in Jesus' name. He's a defeated foe. Nothing like that. It was just a report of the bad. And then really, in effect, blaming God. Well, I don't know why the Lord has taken me through this. You know? And, uh, and I was just a young guy, and I thought, and that didn't make any sense at all. Well, then it was years later in study, I realized that The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So first off, if there's any stealing, killing, and destroying going on, by definition, it's not God. Right. By definition, it's the devil. That's right. And then the other thing is, if there's any stealing, killing, and destroying going on, it must be offensive to God to give him credit for it. Right? It must be. And uh, we, have, we can't claim ignorance because he put it right there. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have life. Well, if he had just stopped there, that would have been fine with me. But he said, and have that, pardon me, and have that life more abundantly. And so my whole life, you know, people have chipped away at this idea that you shouldn't have that job, you shouldn't have that hot wife, you know, you shouldn't have... Uh, more than whatever it is, 2.2 average children. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. I mean, I have faced this my whole life. And what people are really doing is slamming what he said, that it was his will that we have life more abundantly. That's the will of God. Say it out loud. The will of God, will of God for, my life, for my life is that I have life, I have life more, abundantly. more abundantly. All right. And then you get this in your heart. See, what happens is you start confessing this stuff and you get this in your heart. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You get that down in your heart. And when stealing, killing, and destroying comes down the road, you don't meekly accept it. See, if it's the will of God, right? If it's the will of God, you humble yourself and you submit to it. But now if it's Satan, well, I, I, I'm going to have a different countenance. I'm going to have a different spirit. I'm going to rise up, man. I'm going to war. You see what I'm saying? A few, I don't know, about a year ago, you know, I'm, because of early morning prayer, I go to bed early. So I go to bed. I'm asleep. And the alarm goes off. Default. You know? I got the 45 in one hand, I got a clip in the other, and I'm coming down the hall. I got the light on and the laser. I'm ready. And I hear this little vo voice, don't shoot, it's just me. <laughs> but my point is, you just strap on your man britches, and you prepare to run the devil out of your house. Amen. You see where I'm headed? Yes. 
But if, you, if the devil can talk you into thinking it's the will of God, you are sunk before you start. He's a deceiver. So part of, part of this thing of victory, part of this thing of winning, part of this thing of overcoming is knowing who's, who the enemy is. Knowing who the enemy is. Knowing who the enemy is. And, and his works forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And then you have to get this in your, your thinking process. And the younger you are, the more so you have to work at it. And that is you're not going to change God's mind. I am the Lord, I change not. So you're not going to change his mind. All right. A companion verse, Matthew 16, 19. Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's where we left off last week. So we have authority. So in this matter of confession, I'm not just confessing, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, the Lord my God is meeting all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Therefore, I believe, I receive on a seven-day basis, there's enough money coming to meet all of my needs, pay all of my bills on a, every seven days. You know, praise God. I'm being made rich in every way so that I can be generous on every occasion. I believe in Jesus' name. I believe I receive on a seven-day basis more money than I need is coming. It's on the way. The money's coming. Amen. And when, I, when I'm looking at, you know, red numbers, the money's coming. The money's coming. The money's coming. All right? But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a, a different kind of confession. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth. So who's going to do the binding? We'll be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So who's going to be doing the loosing? Okay, so don't you think that a lot of prayer is people trying to talk God into doing some binding and loosing? You know, Lord... You know, I sure would appreciate it if you get the devil off my back. Lord, I sure would appreciate it if you'd, you know, get some money in here. Well, that's not what he's saying here. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I don't, I don't say we all have this kind of authority. I don't, I don't believe we all walk in this kind of authority, but... You know, Peter, Peter told uh, Ananias and his wife, uh, told Ananias' wife, the same men that carry your husband out are going to carry you out. And she, she dropped over dead. That's authority. That's authority. So we have authority. Of course, you know, unless we're in a place of leadership, we don't have leadership level authority. But you have authority over your life. If you have children in your home, you have authority over their, their lives and their bodies, you have the right, you have the right, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the right to tell Satan that he, ha he is a defeated foe, Jesus has made an open show and spectacle of him on Calvary's cross, and he has no right, no place, no authority. This is what I confess every day of my life. Satan, you're a defeated foe. Jesus made an open show and spectacle of you on Calvary's cross. You, you have no right, no place, and I run through it. You have no right, no place, no authority in my life, Sue's life, Austin's life, Jessica's life, Sophie's life, Michaela's life, Derek's life, Christina's life. You have no right, no place, no authority in my body, Sue's body, Austin's body, Jessica's body, Sophie's body, Michaela's body, Derek's body, Christi Christina's body. And I run through it and I, tell, I declare to him, well, who do you think you are? Well, I'm a child of God. Amen. See, and if, if you don't have... If I didn't exercise authority, I mean, I'm in management. So, so you park, you come in here. Have you noticed the building never looks like it's more than a year old? Have you noticed that if you see something scuffed, you know, 30 days later, it's, it's painted over? Have you noticed all that? Well, that doesn't just happen. There's not some building fairy that runs around here and polices all this. In other words, somebody has to be in management. Somebody has to be exercising authority. If, if you don't exercise authority over your life, who's going to exercise authority over your life? And we have authority. Say it out loud. I have authority, I have authority. As, a as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So the basis of your authority is not your opinion. The basis of your authority is the Word of God. See, when... We, we dealt with last Sunday, John 15, is it verse 7? If you, if you abide in me and my words, 
if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done unto you. So what's the basis of my authority? I mean, if somebody were in the army, even if they were a rank like a full bird colonel, they're just not allowed to give any kind of order they want. These orders come from above. Right? I mean, I could be a commander on a submarine ship and think, oh, I could take care of North Korea. Let me just hit this button right here and we will settle this deal. Right? But you don't have that authority. The, the authority comes from above. Our authority comes from above. Our, he gave us his word. That's our authority. That's the basis of our authority. So if I move off of the word on any given area, mora morally or with regard to healing or with regard to success or with regard to prosperity, when I move off of his word, I in effect deauthorize myself. I don't, I don't any longer have authority. And what he's really saying here is this. Look at the language of it. I, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What he's really saying is, if you'll stand with me in my word, I'll back you up. I'll back you up. So Sue and I are preaching one night in Mexico City. This might have been, I don't know, 15 years ago. And uh, it was just fabulous. I mean, there were just demons. I, I'd never been in a place with so many demons, which really makes for an exciting meeting. And so, uh, and, and if you start casting devils out, and there's a lot of devils in people in countries where they do witchcraft, and a lot of this witchcraft goes back to a tradition of going to a witch when a woman's pregnant to ascertain the sex of the child. And so a lot of witchcraft. So, But once you start casting devils out in the third world or second world Mexico is, they bring more and more and more because there's a cure in town. All right, so we're, we're maybe about the third night. And, this, the, and I've been noticing this young man. He was there, but he didn't come forward. Nobody brought him forward. I think it was about the third night he came forward. And he said, I have a devil. And I said, uh, I, I want to get rid of him. And he listed a whole bunch of stuff this devil made him do. And I said, you're sure? You're telling me the truth. You want to be rid of this devil? Yeah. And so I commanded the spirit. I'm not talking to the person. It doesn't have anything to do with the person. It's a spirit. And I don't have authority over that person. I have enough trouble exercising authority over this person. I don't have authority over that person, but I have authority over that spirit. And I said, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to come out of them. Now, people who don't know what they're doing, they like to talk to these devils. Look, why would you, this is like talking to a politician. Why would you ask a devil anything? I mean, even, oh, you know, Jesus, did, well, you, you're not Jesus. So, I mean, even if you ask him his name, how do you know he's not lying? Right? So I, I, I don't want to converse with the devil. And... Uh, so I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Satan, I command you to loose this young man. I command, I command you, spirit of evil, to come out of him. And I went through my typical normal thing, which has worked in 40 countries of the world. Nothing. I was shocked. First time in my life. It didn't work. So I just took a couple of steps back and I prayed in the spirit. Sunday morning at nine o'clock, Austin's going to be ministering on a spirit-filled life, the power of a spirit-filled life. Let me tell you what, there are times in life, for example, when you have children and you're befuddled and you don't know what to do, that's when you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit because you don't know how to pray. So I just took a couple of steps back and I just prayed in the spirit 15, 20 seconds. And I had no idea what I was going to do. And I stepped back up to him and I heard these words come out of my mouth. I had never thought these words. I heard these words come out of my mouth. I said, Satan, I commanded you to come out of this young man in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if you disobey my command, I will stand 
at the last day and I will testify to God that you disobeyed the name of Jesus and that spirit came out of him. See, I was backed up. You see what I'm saying? Because it wasn't my authority. I didn't make up the name of Jesus. I didn't write the Bible. This is, I'm not operating in my authority. But he, and if he didn't want me authorized, he should never have told me that. He authorized me. I will give you. So who has the keys of the kingdom, people? Talk to me. Who has the keys of the kingdom? And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So maybe there's drugs in the home with a teenager or there's problems going on. Who has authority in your home? Talk to me. Who has authority in your home? You do. You're, you're, you're the adult, hopefully. Hopefully. Because I've met 60-year-old children. You're the adult, hopefully. So you have the right to exercise authority. Now, I don't have the right to exercise authority in the next guy's house. And you have to understand this, that our authority over other people is only efficacy to the degree to which they're affecting us. In other words, if somebody's harassing me at work, I can say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Satan, I rebuke you and I command that demon that's causing me all this trouble on the job to cease and desist. You can do that, but you can't, you can't cast the devil out of somebody that doesn't want the devil cast out of them. I stood as a, as a teenager, I stood as a teenager next to a man casting out devils one night at a meeting in Ohio, and there was a young, I don't, it was a, it was a woman, it was a woman, middle-aged woman, and he tried to cast the devil out of her, and she opened her mouth, and she said, I, in this Hollywood creepy voice, she says, I like my devil, he keeps me company. And he turned to me, and he told me, he said, now watch and learn, he said, don't ever forget this, he said, you don't have authority, in someone's life that they don't yield to you unless it's a child in your house or a husband or a wife. In other words, that woman liked her devil. What are you going to do about it? You can't do a thing about it. And this is what makes addictions so dangerous because you want them to be free. But sometimes they don't want to be free. And addictions could be pornography or drugs, or alcohol. I mean, there's all kinds of addictions. And this is why our advice is always to young people and always to parents with young people in the home, just don't go down those roads because it's a whole lot easier to never be addicted to drugs or alcohol than trying to get delivered from drugs or alcohol. Amen. It's better to just not go down that road. That's right. Amen. And the same thing with pornography. See, the more pornography a young person is exposed to, the less likely they are to have a normal life, a normal marriage, and to have a normal family. And let me throw this in as long as I'm there. People develop unnatural appetites. And when you get accustomed to and addicted to unnatural appetites, natural pleasures no longer satisfy I mean, that's what homosexuality is about. In other words, people get into a lifestyle or they get seduced or they get raped, whatever it is, and they, they, they get exposed to an unnatural pleasure. And then a pleasure that is natural no longer satisfies. So the best thing is just don't go down those roads. Just, just don't go down the road of drugs. Don't go down the road of alcohol. Don't go down the road of porn. Just don't do it. And then if you have children in the home, they're too young to make these decisions for themselves, so you have to help them, right? So which means you ought not be on the weed, right? You can't be, you know, uh, you know, smoking dope for your glaucoma, supposedly, and then telling them that they shouldn't be on the weed, right? Right, right, right? Or telling them don't drink while you got wine coolers in the fridge. All right. So let's shift gears. 1 John 5, 4. What is the victory? Where am I going to find the victory? Your faith is the victory. Say it out loud. My faith, My faith is the victory. So your victory is not Pastor Gene's faith. Your victory is not Pastor Sue's faith. Your, victory, your faith is your victory. 
1 John 5, 4, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So it's almost like the positive motivational saying, if it's going to be, it's up to me. It's not really up to me. It's up to me and God. But I have to engage. If I don't engage, if I don't take authority over my life and my situation, who's going to do that? A uh, companion verse, 1 John 4, 4, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Say it out loud. The one who is in me is, is greater yes, than the one who is in the world. Yes, All right, so... Hold your place in 1 John. Look over at Revelation 12. Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And so we don't hardly hear this anymore. This is kind of an old time concept and teaching, and that is the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lord Jesus. When I was a boy growing up, you'd hear this term used in church all the time, to plead the blood. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony. And uh, you go to Isaiah 53, you study the atonement and what's included in the atonement. It's not just the forgiveness of sins. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. So I don't need drugs. I don't need alcohol. I don't need to take a pill to sleep at night because the, the, my peace is in the atonement. Healing is in the atonement. So the blood has power. The blood was shed not just for my sins. The blood was shed for my peace. The blood was shed for my healing. So it says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Then back to 1 John, 1 John 5, 4, everyone born of God overcomes the world. So overcoming, the overcoming lifestyle is not for Pastor Gene and the five percenters. The overcoming lifestyle is not intended for, uh, you know, the 10 percenters. Because right here we see in 1 John, John is saying, everyone born of God overcomes the world. Say it out loud. The normal natural life for every believer is to live an overcoming lifestyle. See, that's normal. It's normal to overcome. But in churches, the overcomers tend to be unusual cats. But that's not the way it's meant to be. We should all be overcomers. And then let's go to Matthew's gospel. You have to be mindful. All right, because you have authority, you have to be mindful of your words. Okay, so, you know, if a, if a private is in the army and, and he's in the trenches, maybe it doesn't matter what he's talking about. But if, but if a full bird colonel's walking by, it does matter what's coming out of his mouth. I mean, I mean, right, right? Am I right? If a private is in the foxhole and he says to his buddy, you know, pass the cigarettes, let's kill them all and let God sort them out. Well, that's two guys. But if a general comes by and says, boys, kill them all and let God sort them out, that's a little different situation because somebody's going to answer for what just came out of that guy's mouth. Am I right? So if you have authority, you have to exercise it, but you can't be careless with it. You have to be mindful of the authority that God gave you. Matthew 12, 36, 37, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken, for by your words you'll be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. And when I was a young man, I always took that to mean, you know, like the judgment seat of Christ and the future and eternity and all that. But as the years have gone by, I think that, and especially we were just in Numbers 13 and 14 two Sundays ago, I think it really it has more, maybe it is entirely about this life, that I'm acquitted or I'm condemned by my words. We saw in Numbers 13 and 14, God said to them, I'm going to do to you the very things I heard you say. So he was holding them to account to their words, right? See, if I'm a person of authority, then I have to be responsible. And I know this is completely counterculture because our culture is into irresponsibility, I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken, for by your words you'll be acquitted, by your words you'll be condemned. So idle words, is he talking about, he could be talking about telling crass jokes or, uh, you know, vulgar talk or something like that. But couldn't he also mean to say something counter to the word of God? I mean, wouldn't that be vain or idle? 
So he says, for by your word you'll be acquitted, and by your word you'll be condemned. All right, now, with all of this in mind, let's go over to Romans 3, 3, and 4. Romans 3, 3, and 4. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. Say it out loud. Let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you, are, when you speak and prevail when you judge. All right, so if you go online... And let's say you type in a name. You type in a name. Let's say you go online and you type in the name Kenneth Hagen. Pages and pages and pages and pages of criticism. Condemnation. He doesn't know what he's talking about. False prophet, all of that. And I could mention other names, but I think, you know, he drew a lot of lightning. But I knew the man, and I noticed that all that criticism didn't affect him. I mean, the man literally ate a pint of ice cream every night before he went to bed. And he lived up into his 80s. I mean, I was around him more probably than any of my fathers in the faith. I never saw the man sick, not once. And the man had a Gulfstream jet. Doesn't sound like a big loser to me. I mean, people would come from all over the world, sick, to have him lay hands on them. It's amazing. Amazing. So the point is, the other guy's negativity does not affect your faith unless you let it. So the whole world out here can be going broke, but you don't have to go broke. The whole world out here could have the Hong Kong flu, but you don't have to have the Hong Kong flu. I mean, the whole world could be affected by this or that, but it doesn't have to affect you. The other man's lack of faith, we saw that, didn't we, in the 12 spies? The, tw the 10 spies' negativity did not keep Caleb and Joshua out of the promised land. Well, this is the New Testament take on that. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? See, and then I tie that back to where we started tonight in Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So if his word is settled, right? If his word is settled, how does Job Blow's unbelief affect God's word or me? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. And this all, to me, in my mind, has to do with covenant. See, Abraham did not walk the earth as other men did. He had, he had Pharaoh to deal with. He had Abimelech to deal with. He had the Hittites, the Jebusites, all of this stuff going on around him. But he simply did not walk the earth as other men did. He stood there on a hill and watched... Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Now, the archaeologists say that when you get down there and you dig around, that the, the results of the scientific testing would lead them to believe that a nuclear blast had gone off there thousands of years ago. Well, you know, Abraham, so what's that like? You know, he's standing there, a rich man, you know, rich man, rich man, rich man, lived to 175, rich man. Did I mention rich man? And he watches these people get nuked. But covenant doesn't mean you don't care because it was the same man, Abraham, that pled for those cities. But the fact is, when the fire came down, the sulfur, the brimstone, it did not affect God's man. See, the other man's negativity will not affect you unless you allow it to. Amen. Unless you believe what they're believing. Wait a minute. Unless you say what they're saying. Or how about this? Unless you do what they're doing. Don't, what do you think would have happened if Abraham had been like Lot and gone down to Sodom and got it on? Pastor. Well, you think they would have made him an elder of the city without him getting it on? He sat at the gate. He was an elder of the city. You think you could be on the city council of San Francisco without being, you know, fruity? <laughs> right? 
So you can't act like them. You can't talk like them. So there has to be a distinctiveness. Say it out loud. I want to win. I want to overcome. I want to prevail. So I have to be distinctive. See, I have to be different. I can't look like the world, smell like the world, talk like the world, act like the world, and then expect the blessing of God. Now, I realize this is what's being taught on Christian television. But I'd like to ask, how's that working for you? In other words, if I want this word to work for me, well, I got to line my life up to the word. I've got to line my mouth up to, to the word. I've got to line my faith up to the word. I've got to line my conduct up to the word. If some did not have faith, will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, so you may be proved right. So you may be proved right when you speak. So you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. See, so it looks like you're out of money. It looks like there's not enough money. It looks like you don't have the money. But your judgment is money cometh. Your judgment is the Lord's meeting all of my needs. Your confession is the money's on the way. So you may be proved right. And that's a testimony. A testimony is not saying what the devil's been up to. A testimony is to give God credit for performing his word. And, you know, you hear testimonies around here sometimes, and it's all right. You know, man, you know, we went through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, but praise God, we just hustled on out of there, and God helped us. So we're not denying reality. We're just denying Satan's right to keep us in the mess. We're coming through. The word is working. Say it out loud. I'm coming through, and the word is working. And I'm going to quit here at this verse, Isaiah 43, 26. And this is probably, I don't know. I don't know that it's the most important thing I learned from Kenneth Hagin, but I would say it probably impacted my life more than anything I learned from Kenneth Hagin. Isaiah 43, 26, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. My gosh. So now why would he say that if he didn't want you to do that? He says, put me in remembrance. So what is prayer? What is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is not going to God and saying, I don't have enough. Don't you think God knows your checkbook balance? Don't you think God knows uh, the bills that you have in your desk drawer? Don't you think, you think God, I mean, if God's got the hairs on your head numbered, why would you think he's ignorant about other stuff? So if you go to God and you say, well, I don't have enough and you know, I'm running short. Well, what information really is being communicated? And really, all you're declaring is unbelief. All right. So really, is that prayer or is that complaining? It's complaining. So what, how are we supposed to pray? Well, <laughs> give him the credit. Give him the glory. And as he says right here, put him in remembrance. Put him in remembrance. So, you know, we're not going to God and saying... Uh, you said in Philippians uh, 4.19 that you'd meet all my needs and all my needs aren't met. And, you know, I'm here to demand that all my needs be met. No, that's not going to work out so well. But you, you're allowed to put him in remembrance. Thank you, Father God. See, this is what Moses did. And this is how Moses saved that generation. He put God in remembrance that God had promised to lead them to the, to the promised land. God had, he put God in remembrance of what God had said. That's how Moses pleaded the case of the Israelites. And that's how we plead our case. Thank you, Father God. There's enough money coming. Thank you, Father God. Your word says. There's enough money. There's enough. The Lord, my God, is meeting all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I am so grateful. I mean, you know, it may look one way, but I thank you, Father God. That's not the way it really is. I praise your holy name. You have promised to meet all of my needs. You're putting him in remembrance and you're not complaining. You're not criticizing and you're not groveling. Right. Amen. I mean, what would you think? What would you think? What would you think? If you gave one of your daughters a Christmas present and they, they put it back in your lap and said, I'm not worthy of this, you would think, who, who birthed this stupid child? <laughs> Must have got swapped at the hospital because nothing that stupid could have come out of me. Right? 
Right? right. You give them a present and they, 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 they act all humble and reject it. I mean, a, a child, how stupid is that? But that's what God's people do. That's what God's people do. Oh, I'm unworthy. Oh, really? Well, you just denigrated the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because he died on Calvary's cross to not just forgive you of your sins, but to, to cleanse you and to purify your life so and to authorize you, to enable you, to empower you to stand in the presence of God. And you dare say that you're unworthy? Well, I'm just a worm. Is that right? So the Lord Jesus Christ bleeding and dying and suffering at the hands of politicians and religious folks and suffering the cruel death that he suffered just so you could say that you're not worthy? So he, he accomplished what? Nothing? And, and the word, King James, is propitiation. It, it's accrediting. It's accrediting. It's accrediting. And so, you know, you go on a cruise with a particular credit, uh, credit card, and you get to the ship, and you check in, and uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you have to ask for a statement. I ask for a statement. I want to make sure, you know, everything is the way I thought it was supposed to be. They show you the statement. You just got on the ship, right? You haven't spent a dime, haven't had lunch, haven't done anything. And it shows $500 credit. Oh, I didn't work for that. It's a credit. I don't even deserve it. It's a credit. Well, that's what, that's what propitiation means. It's credited to your account. You're not worthy. It's credited to your account. He, by his work on Calvary's cross, credited righteousness to your account. So don't you dare hang your head and, and talk like you're unworthy and sing songs about... We, you notice we don't sing songs about being worms. No. Now you can't, you know, smoke the weed, pop the pills, uh, go have an immoral lifestyle, and then march right into his throne room. That won't work out so well. But if you're living the life, if you're living the life and, and you confess your sins, not to me, but to him, and you ask him to forgive you of your sins, you are cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are purified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, you stand in the stead of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he is your elder brother. God has made you his child. You are a child of God. If you're living the life, if you've confessed your sins, if you've asked his forgiveness. So you literally have the same right to stand in his presence as the Lord Jesus Christ. But see, we're not taught this. You go to church and you find out, well, you're not worthy. You're no count. You're no good. You don't deserve. I, I don't need to go to church to learn that. I could have learned that at home from my parents. No, I need to go to church. I need to find a church. I need to find a church where they're going to tell me who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not an animal and, and I'm not unworthy and I'm not a worm. No, I have been, I have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. I have been authorized to speak his word. I have been given authority over the evil one. I have been authorized to command devils in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I have been given the word of God that whatever I bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever I loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I have authority. I do not walk the earth as other men do. Amen. I'm out of time. Hope you got something out of it tonight.